I was four years old when this photo was taken in December of 1997 in Aleppo, Syria. Next to me is my brother and my single mother who stood tall and alone in the courtroom earlier that year to get a divorce. Divorce is one of the biggest crimes a woman can commit in our conservative society. It is considered a true failure in her only mission in life to create and protect her family. The photo was also taken on my birthday and the dress I'm wearing was the first thing I called a dream. I had found it in a children's magazine and ran up to my mom saying, hey mom, I just found the dress of my dreams. Can you help me make it? As a four year old, I thought it was the biggest dress in the world and I wanted my mom to knit it for my birthday. I didn't care how crazy it looked or how long I'll have to wait to have it. One by one, the thin strings of yarn started taking shape. The sleeves, the front, the back, and the skirt. And after months of knitting and fitting, the pieces were finally put together. And here I was touching my dream. I was in fact walking in it and it was all around me. I was so happy when my dress was done that I started spinning and my crazy dress flare up in the air. And I said, mom, look, I can fly, I can fly. My dress is gonna make me fly. Yes, she said, you are flying because only girls are born with wings. Don't let anybody clip those wings. I didn't understand why would she say that at that time. I was so proud of my mom and my dress that I insisted to wear it the next morning instead of my uniform to go to school. Everybody thought it was a crazy idea to go with that crazy dress to school, but it was my dream dress and I wanted everyone to see it. 14 years later, my dreams grew bigger than just a dress. I wanted to go to the university of my dreams, the University of Aleppo at that time. When your dreams grow bigger, however, so do the mountains you have to climb to reach them. As a young woman, I was slammed by the stigma of my mother's divorce. I would hear phrases like, she's inappropriate, she was not raised in a normal family and she will absolutely fail to become a mother just like her mom. Only if their words could take shape, they would look like those giant clippers my mom told me about when I was four. I was in a constant battle to defeat those stereotypes. Later on that year, my fight grew bigger than just battling words. The war in Syria started as I was in my sophomore year in college. A lot of things started to either be taken away from my life or getting introduced into it. Things that I was not familiar with. The start was the sound of bullets coming from far away. And I had never heard a gunshot before. These sounds started to get louder and closer. We started going to our doors and windows and closed them, thinking maybe we can keep this outside. Maybe if we're home, we'll be safe. But apparently not. On the dusk of a summer day of 2012, an explosion slammed all the doors and windows open in our home. All I remember was waking up standing on my feet as a shock wave of hot air blew through my hair and ears. I heard my mom and brother screaming my name as I screamed theirs. I was leaning on the walls of the house, running to them, and I found myself clinging so hard to my brother's shirt, my nails almost pierced my palms. That was what scared to death feels like. The next hour was utter silence, pierced by the sound of ambulances running around our neighborhood. 
The three of us were sitting in the corridor, shocked and speechless. The next morning, we decided to take a walk to see what happened. And a five-minute walk from home looked like this. Things didn't stop at the doors and windows, unfortunately. The war started to be present in every single detail of our lives. Our electricity and water got targeted. And for years, our city would fall into abject darkness and silence after sunset. I had never imagined there would be days when I open both my eyes and not be able to see. I started doing things that sounded crazy, even to me. I, I used to count the stairs to not trip and fall. I used to walk around my house touching the furniture to feel my way and navigate it through the house. I used to iron my clothes with a teapot and place my fingers on the tip of the glass to feel the water reaching the top. Later on that year, things got even worse when an extremist group occupied a street in my neighborhood. My mom came from work one day and said, listen, you have to pack. You have to pack and go. You can no longer stay here. You are not safe if you stay here. And I was thinking, how can I not be safe if I'm home? And what about my bachelor's degree? By the end of that week, I was so angry I had to leave that I packed everything. Every childhood picture, every piece of clothing, every hairpin. I would rather drag my entire life with me than let anyone lay hands on any of it. I left before the sunrise and I was wearing a headlight as I dragged my suitcases down the stairs. I didn't know when or if I'll be back. And my biggest fear in that moment was there something going to happen to my family while I was away. I got up the stairs again and I decided to spend my last minutes standing beside my brother's bed. He was sleeping. I just wanted to watch the silhouette of his chest going up and down. I just wanted to capture an extended image of him alive before I left. That moment could be the last moment I was going to see him and it felt so real. I left to Lebanon and after five months of living in Lebanon, I received the call that altered the direction of my life. The University of Aleppo was bombed on the 15th of January of 2013 on the first day of midterms exams. I could barely breathe. My brother's chest going up and down, my mother's goodbye tees and the faces of tens of my friends passed before my eyes in seconds. I could not run to them this time. They were miles away. All I had was the graphic photos on my computer and a phone in my hand. And as my tears blocked my vision, I was calling everyone. By the end of that day, I learned that my family survived, but four of my friends had died. I could not think about anything. I could not comprehend that they were no longer there. And I could not think about anything but the surreal idea of going back to Aleppo. Within less than a week, I packed everything again. And I took one of the most dangerous roads on earth to go back home. The road was filled with snipers, tanks, landmines. I looked at the road through two bullet holes in the window of the bus and houses along the way were burning. I did not know what I was doing, but I knew one thing. I wanted my bachelor's degree more than I wanted my life. 
So I got back to Aleppo and I started my career in the humanitarian field. I also enrolled fully in classes in the University of Aleppo. Year after year, day in and day out, I studied my entire bachelor's degree by the faint light of a candle. On the third anniversary of the university explosion, I was studying to graduate college. I was sitting in my room as I lift, and as I lift my head up to look in the dark, freezing room and look at our windows shaken by the bombs falling around, then I looked down at my purple fingertips. I had a frightening thought. Since I was 18 until this moment, my life has been marked by a timeline of explosions and filled with traumatic memories. I had read once that the things you experience during your 20s are supposed to be the things you want to remember most when you grow older. Is this going all I have to remember when I'm older? I started thinking that the war will always be a chapter of my story, but I should never allow it to become the whole book. I needed to write a different chapter. I didn't have magazines at that time to search for a dress to dream about, but I needed a dream. It was not like I needed to survive to have that dream. I needed a dream to survive. I needed to start something in my head. So I started simply thinking, what are some of the brightest cities in the world? And there it was. I found it. I want to go to New York City. It was like a million lights lit up in my head. I got excited. I held my candle and walked towards the window of my room. I couldn't see anything outside in the dark. It was just me, my candle, and the reflection of my face on the glass. But as I stood there, I started imagining myself standing by another window in one of those skyscrapers. And what if that could be possible? And what if I can make it happen? I went to bed that night with a very crowded mind and one bold idea. The war has taken everything from me, even those I love. But I just found one thing that even the war cannot control. I have a dream, it is in my head, and the war cannot kill my dream unless it kills me. And as long as I'm alive, I'm going to walk towards that dream. I woke up the next morning, and just like when I was a little girl, I was thinking about my crazy dream. I started thinking, what is going to be my first step to walk from Aleppo to New York City? And just like I did for years in the war, and I'm going to invite all of you to do this with me briefly. I sat on the edge of my bed that morning, and I wrapped my fingers around my neck to feel my heartbeat. I was alive. I was still there. And I just woke up one more time in this very dangerous city. That's all I had and that's all I needed to keep moving forward. My next step was applying to a fellowship program that an American friend told me I should consider. I used to go to my exams and in the morning and write my application essays at night. I graduated from the University of Aleppo in May of 2016 and after months and months of interviewing, I finally interviewed for a placement in New York City in November of 2016. And I got it. <laughs> and just like my crazy dress, I got my visa on my 24th birthday, the Christmas Eve of 2016. 
I was spinning again in the streets and jumping and dancing. This dream is actually going to make me fly, fly far across the ocean to New York City. A dream as big as that, though, needed a skilled knitter as well. Or maybe a group of knitters. And what a better way to get to know New York City than through the eyes of another single mother who decided to give me a place to call home. The things I want to remember about my 20s started at her home in Brooklyn. Ask me about my 20s because I'm not afraid anymore. Ask about my 20s and I'll tell you about the war. Then I'll tell you about our loud movie nights and summer neighborhood parties and car trips to the beach. I'll tell you about the goosebumps I got the first time I stood by a window in a skyscraper. I'll tell you about all the times I danced and sang with the street artists in New York. And I'll tell you about the time I met President Obama. I'll tell you about my birthday and Christmas in the brightest city in the world that I call home. Today, I have a home on 13th Street in Brooklyn. And I have a home in every city, in every, in every corner, in every street in New York City. I have a reflection in a million windows and open my eyes to see a million lights. My dreams were knitted by two single mothers who sit an ocean away from each other. They're knitted by those who were, whose lives were cut short back in my home country. And they're knitted by the people of New York City who, who dragged my suitcases on the subway stairs and mentored me and made sure that I stay here. A lot of things I learned in New York, but there's one thing that was very important, is that New Yorkers are sometimes born beyond the wall and across the ocean with a big dream. I dreamed about a dress, I got the dress. I dreamed about graduating from the University of Aleppo, I graduated. I dreamed about going to New York City. New York City is my home. I dreamed about meeting a president I met too, Carter and Obama. I dreamed about doing a TEDx talk and here I am today. I stand here today in a pink little dress and giant unclipped wings and dreams as loud and big and crazy as New York City. I stand here today to prove that single mothers are amazing and girls, girls can fly. I stand here to prove that dreams can be bigger than stigmas and visas and borders and walls and oceans and even bombs. My name is Abir. I am Syrian. I am a woman. I am an immigrant. I am the proud daughter of two single mothers. I went to the Syrian war and I won. Thank you.